Good afternoon. I think we should begin this afternoon's program. I see some people are still filing in, in the back of the room. Could you please take your seats? And we'll begin shortly. Before we officially begin, I wanted to start by having you meet and see our family. This group is made up of faculty and students, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels. I want you to know that only three years ago, this group could not have been assembled like this on stage. We have built training opportunities for students and faculty, and we are absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to share our work with you today. So again, I wanted you to see our VL2 family. Now they'll make their way off stage, and we'll begin with the presentations. To start, I'll introduce myself. I'm Laura Ann Petito. I'm the co-PI and the science director of the National Science Foundation and Gallaudet's Science of Learning Center, called the Visual, Lang Visual Language and Visual Learning Center, otherwise known as VL2. VL2 is interested and committed to understanding how humans learn, especially how humans learn through the eyes, and what the impact is on the human brain, on the plasticity of the brain as well, and on higher cognitive functions, like learning to read, learning languages, and learning to become a healthy bilingual adult. VL2 is committed to four primary areas of focus listed here. We are committed to education, science, translation, and finally, impacting society, changing our minds and changing our world. Around commitment one to education, we are committed to the education of future generations of students, as you just saw today, not only at the graduate level, but also at the undergraduate levels, to open up our students' opportunities to do avenues in STEM, and to train the world's top scientists and to ask leading questions in science. But more than that, we aim to train students to become leaders, leaders in a world that will include their science, their areas of expertise, their culture, and their language to become true experts in their disciplines. Around commitment two, VL2 is also committed to revolutionary science. We capitalize on new technologies and integrate them to ask new questions that have never before been asked and until now have been impossible to answer. For example, here at Gallaudet, we use state-of-the-art thermal infrared imaging combined with neuroimaging technology using FNIRs, also integrated with eye tracking data for behavioral information. By combining all three types of data, we're able to ex conduct experiments on young children to identify when babies are responsive, engaged, and interested in order to understand when they're ready to learn, even before the baby is able to express itself by using language. 
at five and six months of age, we're able to understand their development and see when a child is ready to learn. More than that, we also take these discoveries and connect them to understanding new learning tools and creating new learning tools. This leads to commitment three. This is an example of where we work cross disciplines across our labs to integrate the teams both within our center, Gallaudet, and across the world. We use this to develop new learning tools that will give language models to young babies that will be targeted towards providing input at the right time for when their brain needs language the most. Here, we combine robotics and avatar technology, as well as our knowledge about critical learning periods to make this learning tool optimal. But VL2 is also committed to changing our minds. And why might we need to change our minds? Because there are many views that are prevalent in the world that underlie policies and actions in our country that are not based on science. Here's an example of what some of those views are. I'm calling this myth number one. Myth number one is that speech is biologically superior. Myth two is that children should first be exposed to speech and then later be exposed to sign language. And that sign language is not really an important language to expose a child to at a young age, that speech should be primary. Myth three is that signing will hurt the development of speech or the child's ability to develop English and that they won't be able to regain those skills. This is an interesting one because this involves uh, universal views and fears about bilingualism. Myth four, people think that good reading requires access to sound. And this, again, is based on an assumption. So schools worldwide focus on intensive training of speech uh, and listening skills for deaf children with the intention that this will ultimately help them to read better. So let's explore briefly some of our findings that we have had at VL2 in our 10-year history that dispel these myths. First, we know that speech is not biologically superior to sign language. Our discoveries show that speech and sign language engage the very same systems in the brain. Imagine that. The very same tissue in the brain that we had always thought was exclusively dedicated to sound is actually used when processing sign language as well. Secondly, the thought that exposing a child to speech first and that sign can come later because people think that timing doesn't matter when exposing a child to signing could not be more wrong. Acquisition of signing and speech, of sign languages and speech occur on the same developmental timetable. The milestones that children hit are the exact same. If you expose a child to sign language later, it is then that they will suffer. Myth three has to do with bilingualism. And there are a number of views that discourage the use of sign language. Reflected here on the slide, people think that learning to sign will impair the child's ability to later speak. And there are policies that say that you should withhold sign language, expose the child to speech, and then only sign later if necessary. So this myth takes a few forms. The first one listed here. One way in which this myth comes up is that people think that children who have cochlear implants don't need sign, just speech training. 
People also think that early bilingual exposure causes language confusion and thus delay. Another is that parents must know sign language well before using sign language with their child. They think that if they're not a proficient signer or fluent, that they shouldn't sign at all with their child because they think that the child won't gain any benefit. And lastly, this myth gives way to the view that children should learn one language first, and then once it's safe, they can be exposed to another language. The research from VL2 has found the following, that all four of these views are false. The scientific evidence does not support any of these views. Myth four, the assumption about reading requiring access to sound in order to become a proficient reader. What we have found is that early exposure to sign language actually gives a child the opportunity to perceive components of language that set up normal pathways in their brains to encourage understanding of language, to parse language into its component parts, which then enable them to map language to print. This is the same way that a hearing child is first exposed to spoken word, and then later, when is exposed to print, they connect the squiggly lines on the page to the language they've been exposed to. The same thing happens with children that are sign exposed. This means that exposure to sign language does not impair reading abilities. In fact, it facilitates it. One exciting finding that we've had, uh, excuse me, we've had a few findings that are very exciting in this area. Researchers use ASL phonological awareness, and they used this to train and teach young children who are hearing and poor readers. So the population was hearing struggling readers. They used ASL phonological understanding with these children and deaf children and found that the hearing readers improved in their reading as well. So hearing children taught about ASL phonolo phonology ended up improving in their reading, showing that ASL phonological awareness training produces stronger English readers meaning that signing doesn't hurt. In fact, it helps. And actually, we could use it as a new aid for hearing children who are struggling to read. So these are just a few examples of the types of discussions that we have about how sign language and speech are biologically equivalent. We've found even more, though. We found that early brain plasticity enables young deaf children to have amazing advantages. So in addition to what we found around biological equivalence, we've also seen that young deaf children have some advantages over their hearing counterparts. Early exposure to a visual language gives a young deaf child an advantage over visual, to process visual information of all kinds, to use their eyes to track information, to then learn vocabulary and learn language, and ultimately become a better reader. Interestingly, hearing children could have had this same advantage, they're born with it, but due to lack of exposure, they lose this ability. So one thing that's very important to point out is that there is a biological imperative about exposure. There is a critical time period for exposure. So taken all together, these different findings that we've made can address our society's views and can change our minds. We now know that deaf children need early sign language for optimal language, reading, and bilingual benefits. And how do you do that? In order to do that, you need to have policymakers ensure that policies are in place that, to ensure that deaf children have exposure to sign language as early in life as possible. So now, turning to our future, 
VL2, as you know, began with support from NSF and Gallaudet. At the very beginning of its inception, we existed as one center, but in looking toward the future, we have created four resource hubs. You'll see presentations about each of those hubs throughout the afternoon. Also, we've built a new PhD program in educational neuroscience. We started small, and now I'm proud to say that we have added three new faculty members. Now, what do each of them do? They provide new knowledge, new discoveries through their labs. Each of them have labs and will be recruiting new students, which hopefully will aid in the retention of students here at Gallaudet and also appeal to faculty who might join other departments. And then, of course, they'll be applying for new grants. They're busy at the moment writing uh, to apply for new grants, which can secure, uh, and in this way, they can secure more funding for the university. But that's not all. We've got big dreams. We stand at the ready to build the very first neuroscience institute here at Gallaudet University. Thank you. We have all of the parts ready. We're ready and waiting to move toward this new part of our future. We have experts in using technologies that can be combined to address scientific questions that will lead to translation. VL2 also has collaborated with Gallaudet's, aligns with Gallaudet's own future. We stand ready to meet Gallaudet's future plans and strategic actions. We are committed to education, the best in science, we are committed to translation, and we are committed to impacting society, to changing our minds and changing our world. And we've already begun on this path. We've made biological discoveries that sign and speech are the same. This has already changed minds. Society in order for society to absorb this concept, this will require a radical shift that speech is not language. Human language is stored in the brain. The brain is receptive to language in any form, whether it's spoken or signed. VL2 has also contributed to science in showing that deaf children have advantages when it's exposed to sign language, and that these advantages can be used to benefit hearing children as well. Altogether, this has translational impact that is beginning to address dogmatic views that are long held and pervasive and have influenced medical and educational policies. It is now time for change. With that, I'll conclude my remarks. And I'd also like to welcome our new president, Roberta Cordano. Thank you for inviting us. This has been an honor to present this week. And thank you so much for choosing Gallaudet. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Clifton Langdon, the Assistant Director for the Brain and Language Laboratory, also known as BL2. I'm also the Science Director for the new Lens Lab, Language and Educational Neuroscience.
I sta don't stand alone. I'm part of a high caliber team of research scientists. The team involves Dr. Petito, founder and scientific director. We have a new postdoctoral research scientist, PhD students from the PhD in Educational Neuroscience program. We also have graduates and undergraduates working for us. The alumni are shown here. These are people from all over the world that have worked with us as part of the BL2 lab. BL2 asks fundamental questions about how humans process language across three domains. We ask questions about the critical periods for language acquisition. In terms of bilingualism, we look at context, how people can learn languages through the context of two different languages that they're exposed to. We also look at how young children look at the squiggly black lines that they see on paper and are able to transition from knowing language to learning to read. We utilize a variety of advanced technologies and yoke them together in order to have a better understanding of human cognition. That teaches us more about the three different domains. We don't only use our system here at Gallaudet, but we collaborate with other scientists to bring additional tools to help us understand more about human cognition. I will talk briefly about one project that touches on all three of our research areas, reading, bilingualism, and language acquisition. That project deals with controversy. It's been controversial thinking about what the brain needs for language. One of the common views that is held in society is that language acquisition should be acquired only through spoken language for optimal brain and tissue development. That view leads to another. The belief that providing early sign language exposure will lead to, uh, will inhibit the ability for normal auditory tissue development. The underlying assumption is that our brain is born looking for spoken language, that we can acquire any spoken language in the world. We conducted a study looking at a perfect group of individuals who help us answer this question. These are individuals who have cochlear implants, which can help us to understand whether or not this is true. What we found is those who had only spoken language exposure required more effort in order to learn to read. Additional findings show that early sign language exposure does not harm children. Those who are early sign exposed are able to take advantage of their neural networks in order to learn English. In this project, we're finding important information about human cognition. We're learning about what the human brain needs in order to acquire language. In short, the human bo brain is born looking for language, whether that is sign language or speech.
thank you for your attention, and thank you for all of the research participants who made this study possible. Good afternoon. You may be wondering who I am. I'm Tom Allen, and I am the co-PI of the VL2 Center, as well as the director of the Early Education and Literacy Lab, which we call EL2. We have a lot of twos in our names. So this is part of my team. And I say part of my team because a lot of my team has been all over the country, lives all over the country, and does research in classrooms and in homes and collaborates with us. I collaborate with people in different schools all throughout the country who are responsible for gathering information for our projects. I also want to point out here that our faculty here at Gallaudet uh, that work with VL2 come from a variety of different departments. We have folks who are interested in early language, early literacy, and we have people from education, psychology, linguistics, who work alongside us in some of our projects. So what do we do? We basically have two areas of focus. The first area is very important, mm -hmm. and we've been working on it since the very beginning of VL2. We develop research and then we create the ability for that research to be used by teachers. We create online mechanisms for researchers. <coughs> when we started VL2, there was no assessment tools for ASL. for ASL. So that was one thing we focused on throughout the past 10 years. The second area of focus, we conduct studies in homes and in school settings to try to identify factors that affect literacy growth. So we can see the connection with BL2, the work that they do with the students in the lab, and our work in the classroom. So real briefly, in the 10 years we've been working on several different assessment tools. And we recently published this book that describes over 35 different tools that can be used by educators, researchers, psychologists in the field of education. And we have deep thinking about uh, a more recent publication we have where visual communication, it's the visual communication and sign language checklist that has collected a large number of designated Repres representations ASL from in ASL skills from children aged birth to five years. We intensively studied their behavior and then gave a checklist to identify for the different age-appropriate skills for teachers to be able to use to assess children's development. We published this book first, and then now we published it on the internet as well in an e-version. So, we determine which one to use based on your previous checklist. So one example, one of the ben benefits of the online version is that you have statements and then we have videos where you can click and see an example of the behavior and you can make a better determination of where the child stands. So this is an example of turn taking in American Sign Language. In this example, you see a child understanding a conversation that involves turn taking. And this is a very important skill to acquire. You can see that the child is deciding when to take a turn. Based upon our research, we know that this skill begins to appear in na native signers at about two years of age, eight months. So this gives you a clear idea of the sequence of development. And we did studies in home and school settings in area two. Like in BL2, we're very interested in busting the myths. One of which is 
that hearing parents can't learn to sign the same as deaf parents. So why even bother trying? So we ask parents all across the nation throughout a range of skills to see if their kids were able to do certain skills. And they answered us in yes or no. And then we divided the parents into three groups. Deaf parents, who could sign. And then the second group was hearing parents, who could sign. And then the third group was hearing parents, who could not sign. And we see here on the chart uh, that even though parents who are hearing, their kids are still getting benefit if the parent can sign. The second myth we busted. Signers, early, sign, early signing will damage a child's emerging literacy skills. So we conducted a longitudinal study where we followed kids over three years. We went to their schools again and again, three times, or three times and gathered information. And then we developed statistical models to show the development of reading. And we watched the impact of early language on these children. The image here shows the size, the different size circles of the relationships they had with uh, reading development skills. The size of the circles shows the relative importance. It shows the relative importance of these different factors. Of these different factors. Early fingerspelling and sign language impacts reading in a very huge way. And it has huge statistical significance and impact. So in conclusion, EL2 and BL2 are working closely together and discovering things about early childhood development in deaf children. So we call that synergy between the two different labs. And that's been an important part of VL2. Thank you very much. All right, good afternoon everyone. My name is Melissa Malzkuhn and I am the creative director and the director of the recently formed lab ML2. I need to start by commenting on how incredible the work is of this team. I take their research findings and then translate this into tools through our technology that we have at the Motion Light Lab. The Motion Light Lab is a space where creative literature meets digital technology to create immersive new learning experiences. Our direction comes from the scientific findings from the other hubs. We take their findings and use them with the ultimate goal of translating these findings into tangible products for children to use, to create resources that children can interact with, to provide early exposure to ASL because we know the importance of early sign exposure. Evidence from the research is abundant. Whether these children are signing in homes, in their classrooms, anywhere in life, we see a direct benefit on these children by having sign exposure. I work with the following team, and they are truly outstanding. Over the years, as students have come and gone, and as we've collaborated with different people, we are now left with this team. We also have a wonderful science director who works with us, Dr. Lorna Quant. She's also a neuroscientist and brings a rich perspective to our work. We have various tools, digital technologies that include one piece of equipment um, that we're excited to have gotten, which is our motion capture cameras and studio. We got this through a grant, and having motion capture technology enables us to do 
to create 3D avatars who can use ASL. This by no means replaces film. We do value the ability for film to capture live sign language, but it flattens it to a 2D surface. Using a 3D technology opens new doors that allows us to research and preserve sign language in ways we have not been able to to date. This also allows for interactivity in that we can incorporate behavioral systems and gaming. The impact and the potential on learning is tremendous. That's why I call this a digital frontier. 3D is still a nascent technology. Where does sign language fit into that? We're starting to answer that question here and answering questions in bold new ways. Along with the foundation that we have from research and the technology, pairing these two creates learning experiences that enable knowledge to happen. In our current study, we're focusing on babies and nursery rhymes, and how nursery rhymes provide the building blocks for language. With motion capture technology, we've created signing avatars, which are a bit computerized, and you can see artifacts of the digital technology. It moves in a less human-like way. But when you use motion capture, the markers create the ability to make avatars more human-like. Let's take a look at what that looks like. This is also available on YouTube, so you can watch the entire story. What is so captivating about this is the rhythmicity that exists in nursery rhymes. We want more of this for young children because it is so captivating for them as well. We can apply this to different platforms to make it interactive. Think then about the implications for preservation of our sign language in a 3D format. Think back to the NAD films and their preservation project in the early 1900s. We're in an age where we have a new capacity to preserve our sign language for generations a hundred, a hundred years from now. So this offers an immense value add. This is a picture of a setup of one of our current projects done uh, as a collaborative effort of a, a pretty large team that spans the country and other nations. We are creating something called RAVE, robotic avatar, and using thermal infrared imaging to map the baby's engagement. The important thing here is for a young deaf child, many of you know that most deaf children, the overwhelming majority, get minimal language input in the early years of life. In turn, it is far too common that deaf children struggle when learning to read. This is a far too common story. What can we do? How can we bolster their language exposure and learning efforts? How can we provide input for the majority of young babies? We've created a tool, this robot here on the left, that is engineered to watch and monitor when a baby is ready for input. This then will activate the avatar or the video. Now we know that this can't replace human interaction, but it can provide some language input that can have downstream effects on the child's development. And we're doing this here at Gallaudet. Now, of course, when we talk about babies, that's the earliest part of our development, but young readers are also important. For that reason, we've also created VL2 storybook apps. 
These are also built on principles from VL2 research. You can engage with these apps in a variety of modes, read, watch, or learn. When you watch the entire story, ASL is preserved in its organic forms. In the read format, it's broken up more like a storybook, and you can see both the text on the page and the ASL. Let me show you what that looks like. We've made a total of eight storybook apps by using the VL2 Storybook Creator. This is a template that we designed so that we could build not just one app, but that we could have a framework ready to create other apps. This means that anyone can use this storybook creator. If you have a good story, if you're a teacher in a classroom and you want to have your students create their own stories, all you have to do is provide the video, the images, and the text. So you can work together with children to expand the amount of literature available for deaf children. Our goal, too, is not only to affect the lives of children here in the US, but to affect children globally. Deaf children worldwide face the same challenges. So we've partnered with people in Japan and Norway to create versions of the Baobab in their signed languages. The Baobab is our first storybook, and it's an original. This was not a translation. This story was created by an entirely deaf team, and all of the artwork, the coding, was all done by deaf professionals. So this is another captivating element of this resource. The next version of the Baobab will be made in Russian Sign Language. The amazing thing is that these resources are available and ready to be shared. The storybook creator is open-ended. The template is one in which you'll see the coding. You can see how it works. What I think is so incredible about this is that it can impact those who want to learn about coding, who want to program without having to start from scratch. Using the template will benefit them as well, not just the children who will ultimately read and use the storybooks. This means that those who use the storybook creator will have further avenues and opportunities open to them because of the experience of coding and working with that template. Here are icons of all of the storybooks we've created so far. At Gallaudet, we aim to be a model for the world, and we don't want to be insular. We want to provide these resources to the world and share them as far and wide as possible. We are a collective community, and it took a collective community to make these happen, to expand the amount of literature available for all our children. With that, thank you very much. If you'd like further information, please visit our website at motionlightlab.com. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Melissa Herzig, Director of the Translation of the Science of Learning Lab, or TL2. What you've seen this morning is amazing basic science findings that we can use to translate into research products, resources, 
And what we've done is making ensure that, that those resources get to the stakeholders who need them. Again, because we've, we have such amazing findings and products that have been developed here, we want to make sure that those resources get to the general public. We are a bridge between VL2 and the world. We work with educators, medical professionals, parents, and children to make sure that they get the resources they need to change their minds, hearts, and the global view on deaf people. Making sure that children get the education they need and doctors get the right information to be able to inform parents about language learning. Here are just a few of the resources that I've mentioned. We have several research briefs, and as you leave, you'll see a table in the foyer that contain our research briefs for you to take. Also, everything is online for you to download if you want further information. These research briefs share our findings from the collaborative work that we do here at Gallaudet, and we translate those into something that is readable and easily accessible for people. We also have a parent package, as well as ASL assessments and storybook apps. We also try to stay connected with our stakeholders to share new information, new research briefs, or scientific findings, as well as new grants that we receive. We connect with our stakeholders through a variety of ways. Our website, we also are, have a Facebook page, and if you are a friend, you can like the information that we share. We don't just provide resources online, but we are actively traveling to different locations, including schools to give presentations to teachers, conferences to share our work, working with families in early childhood education, with children in preschools who invite parents to come and learn from our presentations. We also are out speaking to medical professionals not just sharing the research findings, but actually explaining how the research information translates to what they do every day in the classroom, with the apps. We provide lesson plans in order to help teachers encourage early literacy in children. We also talk with parents about what they can do now at home, not only getting our information, but showing what research says will benefit their children in the homes. And that is part of what we do, is make sure that we share and disseminate this information so that it's usable for the general public. We don't focus only nationally, but also internationally. And this is not just a one-way system. We also have many ways of disseminating information, developing resources, and how to make sure that those resources are high quality for people to use. We also work bi-directionally to make sure that not only are we sharing research findings and that that information is translated into usable products and resources, And again, those are based on research findings. We, before we disseminate these resources, we want to make sure that these will bolster literacy for deaf children, that it will encourage bilingualism, both ASL development as well as literacy in English. Now, we don't want to hold our apps and our resources waiting for quality assurance because we know that children out there in schools and in homes need them now. And so instead of holding them back, we make sure that they are of high quality through this internal process. We make sure that the information has integrity, that we protect consumers, so that they don't misuse or misinterpret our findings. 
We had two avenues of doing this. First is SignWise, a resource for kids, and the second is the BRAC, the Benefits and Risk Assessments. Once our products go through these two quality assurance measures and are, are made available to the public, we do usability studies to get information back from the public about how they utilize our resources, to make sure that they're understandable so that we can continue to improve the resources for the better. Again, this is a two-way translational model. To talk more about SignWise, we take information from several different groups, the NAD, the American Society for Deaf Children, which is a parent stakeholder group, teachers from Gallaudet, and the Laurent Claire Education Center, the Department of Education here on campus, to make sure that our products are of quality. We have developed a quality assurance criteria so that we know that the ASL children are receiving is high quality. Once we have established these criteria, we focus it on products. These could be ebooks, apps, or websites, or printed material. We look at products that have been designed specifically for ASL, for ASL using children and their families. We then combine all of this information on a website so that you can review our material. Not only our material, but material that we've made sure meets the criteria. If the language being used in these products is proficient and good enough to be shared with deaf children, then it can be part of our SignWise website. Because hearing parents don't always have the ability to know what is good quality sign language. That way we have, we have a trusted site where parents can assure that the resources that they're getting are quality. The Department of Ed can also use this to screen resources that they will use in schools. SignWise ensures quality and we also look at the risks and benefits, make sure that our information is not misused and that the benefits outweigh the risks. We want to make sure that the impact to parents and children is, is beneficial. Again, that there's high, high potential for benefit at low risk. Almost like what the FDA does when they review medications to decide it, what the side effects are and if the benefits outweigh the risks. If they do, we make those available on the website. So BRAC functions like the FDA. We're also responsible not only for disseminating information, but for training of future generations of scholars who will do basic science beyond what we do here at BL2. Not only do the basic science, but share it with the world. We do that in two ways. We have the PhD of Educational Neuroscience students, and we train them. You'll hear more about that when Geo presents about our PhD program. We are commit committed to basic cognitive neuroscience and have additional responsibilities of communicating our science findings with the community through translation work to make sure that those findings are not hold, held here at Gallaudet's labs, but are con continually shared with the world. We also have internships and research assistantships that bring people into our four hubs BL2, EL2, ML2, and here at TL2 in order to train the future generation of scientists. We have a great team here. We are committed to 
continually asking the tough questions, to looking at the hot topics, and committed to making sure that our science findings are disseminated so that you are familiar with what we're learning here, that they don't stay in the labs or academic journals, but they are translated for public use. Thank you. Well, this afternoon, you've had the pleasure of seeing and learning all the different hubs we have under VL2. And so I'll talk now of something equally as important uh, as the hubs we have, the Penn program, the PhD in Educational Neuroscience program that we have here at Gallaudet. Gallaudet has made history. It did so three years ago when it established the first PhD in educational neuroscience program. And that three years has gone by in the blink of an eye. We have a very large family now, and we've become a model for different universities all over the world. They have replicated our model and used it at their universities. We recruit top tier students from different universities as well. So I'll explain to you, and you'll under get a better understanding of what exactly those different universities are replicating. So what is educational neuroscience? It's a sister of the Science of Learning Center, and it looks at how the human learns across the lifespan. Now we have educational neuroscience, there's cognitive neuroscience, and cognitive neuroscience looks specifically at how a young child learns in different ways. Language, numeracy, reading, science, socio-moral, emotional debate, development, and then it looks at their behavior in addition to the power of brain data. We use neuroimaging tools that inform us, first of all, what the key components are of learning, when the most critical and optimal time for exposure and learning for a child is, what happens if a child uh, passes that critical period of learning, how forgiving is the brain if they miss any of those uh, exposure. Through our findings, our goal is for society, policymakers, and educators to be able to use our findings to help young children be able to improve their learning abilities and experiences in the classroom. Also, what makes our program unique is that we don't work in silos. We have reached out to different people in other departments and collaborated together. We do this to answer questions about how the brain responds to changes, how it changes as a result of visual language. So this is our Penn family, the faculty, the students, and the students don't just include graduate students, they also include undergraduate students, which is a great opportunity to teach the next generation of scientists. So Penn is also a very unique program. And what makes it unique? We have intense neuroethics courses, all of the Penn students are sent out to different labs all over the world to receive additional neuroimaging training at laboratory, at laboratory rotations. We are also committed to making our information available for translation. And I've talked already about all of the wonderful features that has made the program so unique. Those features allow us students the amazing opportunity for these types of achievements. In my first year here at Gallaudet as a Penn student, I wrote uh, an application for a grant from the National Institute of Health, the NIH. Uh, that grant is a very prestigious award, uh, highly competitive and hard to win, and I ended up winning it. And in addition to what I won, 
uh, my colleague, uh, my classmate cohort, Adam Stone, also won a grant as well. So that's two students here at Gallaudet, the first time in Gallaudet's history uh, who, that have become a powerful model to the rest of the world and for, to show what the program has done for students. So we hope to serve as a testimony to those others to follow. Others are also writing peer-reviewed publications and other research to be published. Other students, like Diana Andriola, another Penn student, went to top labs at Yale University, in her case, uh, working in the Haskin lab. Another Penn student, Bradley White, uh, developed a wonderful uh, statistical toolbox to analyze brain data. And these are only a few of the amazing accomplishments that we've gotten, that we've been able to accomplish as a result of the support from the program. Now, Penn just published in a top journal, Wires Cognitive uh, Science, and we are disseminating our research all over the world. Now, we just found out that our article will be on the cover, actually, of that journal that we published in. It'll be coming out this January. And so we hope that you'll all take a look at it and be able to read it and then understand our newest groundbreaking findings and how humans learn reading, uh, including young deaf children. So in closing, I would like to show you a short video that we, the Penn students, made. It describes what we want for the future. We want to break barriers. We want to create opportunities. We want to inspire women to be involved in science. We want to make a difference in deaf children's lives to train the next generation of scientists. To learn from top scientists all over the world and here at Gallaudet. To understand the brain better. I'm Gio Kartizer. I'm a fourth year PhD student here in educational neuroscience. Thank you. Um, this, that concludes our formal remarks, and we are happy to take questions and comments from the audience. Hi. Um, outstanding talks. I really learned a great deal. I'm the father of three children who are hearing, and many of us in the room, I'm sure, have hearing children, um, otherwise referred to as CODAs. Do you have any studies on CODAs or have any new information that we might not already be aware of? Yes, actually, we have done a great deal of research in which we've had CODAs participate in. We have found that CODAs have an amazing ability to receive benefits from bilingualism and having bilingual education, having early sign exposure and speech exposure. So we have found that they have a very strong language base and strong language skills as a, compared to their monolingual counterparts. given that they've been exposed to both sign language and speech. Dr. Petito, my name's Jim Payne. I'm one of the Board of Trustees. I know you know, know me. I'm, I'm very curious about, with all the medical schools throughout the world, all the medical schools in the country, and three major medical schools here locally in Washington, D.C., why do you believe that this concept has started here, which is a huge differentiator? Give me your thoughts on that. Because this is much, as your point earlier made, this has implication far beyond just the deaf student. Uh, 
um, I know others may want to answer this too. In my eyes, Gallaudet is open to new ideas and is dedicated to thinking outside of those traditional silos that typically exist in academia. At Gallaudet, we want to capitalize on new, exciting ideas, and I've found that students here seem much more open. I've taught at other institutions, other universities, um, some, are, some of which are considered leading institutions worldwide, but many of the students you see come from this way of thinking in which they're already stuck in these traditional silos. So I think that we can serve as a model for the DC metro area, including the medical schools here, and we're already serving as a model. Gallaudet has invited representatives from those medical schools to come to campus. We have connections with those who work at Georgetown Medical School. Our team also participates in one of their Wednesday meetings at the medical school. So uh, the time is just is ripe right now for the type of work that we're doing, but I think it started here because of how open we are to new ideas. Also, uh, if you go back 10 years, when the center was first established, we r responded to um, the RFP that was written by the NSF. So really, uh, you have to credit NSF for having the vision to create uh, a center where these scientific areas would be focused on training and translation, and they would focus to be able to develop the, the new understanding and new knowledge, um, uh, and the state-of-the-art technology. At the beginning, it was established because of all of the science of learning centers. Um, now there are six, and we are one. Uh, we're lucky to be the one that's remaining. So that vision that was originally created, I think, is to, to thank. Um, and VL2 has really accomplished exactly what NSF had in mind. Um, we couldn't say that about the other five centers. <laughs> uh, so really, um, you'd have to go back to the original vision uh, for this interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary science. science to achieve the vision that was um, assigned to us. And it's a very nice justification, and, and we've gotten great support from NSF. I'd like to add to Tom and Laura Ann's responses. All of us here at Gallaudet have a great desire to answer the questions being addressed at VL2. We have the same questions that are shared by stakeholders in the community about why is it that deaf children learn how to read? People think that it might just be because they're deaf and that the best way to answer that is to teach them speech. We know that there are other answers and we are all passionate about finding the truth and to find what works best for our children and also children around the world. So what we learn is not applicable only to deaf children, but it also contributes to science and to our understandings of the human brain. As Dr. Petito said, we want to understand what the brain wants. We understand the brain's capabilities and plasticity, and we understand that the brain is primed for language, regardless of modality, and this is not something that other scientists are studying. So we've broken a lot of ground and paved new areas of understanding how we learn language, and I think that's what makes us unique here. I just, thank you, Melissa. I wanted to add one thing about what Tom just mentioned. We certainly are thankful to the NSF. They are the ones that laid out the initial vision to create these centers, and they funded a number of centers focusing on different topics. Again, there were six across the US, but all of the remaining centers are now defunct. So five of the six are no longer in operation Gallaudet Center is the only one that is still in existence. Not only have we survived, we are thriving. We are becoming a model for the nation and for the NSF. 
the NSF has invited us to go to other countries to talk to them about how to create interdisciplinary science of learning centers. And um, Gio didn't actually mention that he was invited to Hong Kong as part of that effort. He was invited to Hong Kong as a PhD student to teach professionals there, to teach neuroscientists in Hong Kong how to create a science of learning center. And he trained them in neuro neuroimaging technology as well. So we certainly are becoming a model. And we're doing this to survive. How did we survive though? Because Gallaudet University supported us. I need to thank Provost Erding in particular for her staunch support through the years. She has tirelessly advocated for us to make sure that science has been supported at, at the university and fostered. So we also need to give thanks to Gallaudet. We'll take one more question. Hi, my name is Lynn Erting, and yes, I'm in the same family as the provost, yes. Um, I retired from Gallaudet four years ago after working at Kendall Schools in the early childhood program especially. Um, and ironically enough, my son had a very, very deaf child baby eight months ago who was wonderful. But I'm sad to say that we got the same old responses from the medical field, from ENTs, from pediatricians, uh, even some people at Hopkins, I hate to say it, um, who weren't doctors, but not medical field. But I'm so happy to hear that you're reaching out to the medical community and hurry up. <laughs> I'm just so glad that my grandchild had people in his family, you know, to support him and he's so visual and he's, his reception is wonderful and pretty soon he's going to start to sign. So thank you for your work and keep it up. Thank you, it's incredible. And again, with early exposure to sign language, your grandson now has cognitive processing advantages that his hearing counterparts don't have. Right, one of the benefits of being president is I have the privilege of wearing a lab coat. And for those of you who don't know, my mother was a metal, medical technology person. I grew up, she grew up wearing a white coat. I grew up seeing her wear a white lab coat, and so I'm honored to wear one today. So first off, congratulations and thank you. Just a couple of things that I wanted to share in terms of what I noted by watching your comments. You know, sign language is one of the things that um, we can always do. You know, we can sign simultaneously at the same time. Um, the signs for mom and dad can be co-produced as well as the names of those parents co-produced at the same time. You know, your lab is focusing on ASL and its expression and how we can do so simultaneously. I know I'm certainly not the experts. There are others who can do this far better than I. But I think this idea that ASL really can express complex concepts in American Sign Language. We understand that English, of course, is very linear. And as I was watching your presentation, the design that you have of VL2 and all the labs that go with it really focusing on the complexity of ASL. And you're doing this all at the same time, all of these research projects happening simultaneously. As was said by the earlier comment, there's an urgency about this. And you're designing things in such a way is that you're allowing the dynamics of this so that the discovery of brain science is making impacts in people's home, that what you're learning about the brain can impact people in multiple ways. It can impact teachers, it can impact families in the home, all of this happening simultaneously. And so I think that's a beauty of learning and research and education in the 21st century. 
Our children are now being raised in a world where so much is happening at the same time. And, you know, we have greater tolerance for learning in the moment because we try to bring so much together. And I think you are living and breathing what it means to be science, scientist in the 21st century and sharing your knowledge with the world. Secondly, a story that I wanted to share with you that is very unique and special to me. A few days after I had uh, completed my interviews for this position, I was contacted by a woman who wanted to meet me. So the Gallaudet Alumni Office told me that this woman knew my father. And she had this desire to meet me, and I was more than willing to do so. We met in Silver Spring in her living room, and she was an elderly lady moving a bit slowly as she sat before me, and she said she knew my father, that they had grown up together and were in fact very good friends, and she talked to me about how I signed very much like my father did. Melissa Mauskuhn's grandmother, Mary Mauskuhn, was this person. She was a professor here at Gallaudet for 30-some years. She was a graduate of the program here back in the 1940s. Right, she got her BA and then never left. <laughs> she ended up teaching here too. Right, and unfortunately we just lost Mary, what was it, about three, four months ago? Six months ago, yes. As my mother was ending, nearing the end of her life, she wanted to write a book. And, you know, I asked her questions about who were the greatest leaders here who graduated from Gallaudet, who were the pioneers. And one person that she chose was Eric Mauskuhn. Eric Mauskuhn was, in my mother's view, the first sign master and his adaptability to do storytelling was something of note. And of course, this was Mary's husband, Eric. So I think, you know, as I see you here today, I think about your grandparents, I think about my parents, and think about the very interesting connections that exist here. But just to show you that the arc of Gallaudet's work is long, and it's not just long, but long-lasting, and this is a beautiful example of how deaf people have known 100 years ago that when sign language you know, was hoped to be banned, that it would no longer flourish. And, and we mentioned, of course, vedettes and the, the concern that sign language would no longer exist. We, though, as a community, have recognized the uniqueness of our language, but we've never had the signs to back and explain why it is unique as it is. So thank you for the gift that you give us all of the information that you share with us and the community really supports what we have inher inherently known for years. And I thank you very much for that. That concludes our program. Thank you for coming.